gentle, and of course, very modern apes to another episode of The Library of Error, where we are currently reading through the text by YouTuber Standing for Truth titled, Why Human Evolution is False, The Scientific Case for Independent Origins, Has Ape Command Evolution Been Overturned? The answer, as we've seen for many of the other chapters, is a resounding no, but we still have quite a bit to go, so <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Uh, you're thinking, but I thought we finished the last chapter on the last episode, and you're right, but I didn't tell you that half the book is appendices, <laughs> so there's still a lot to go. The appendices are basically just more chapters, but that's fine, I don't mind it, because this first appendix is written exclusively by our friend, ex-breatharian, raw honey eater, and of course, known academic fraud here on YouTube, raw Mac which is just great. Now I know you might be wondering, can we prove that Ramad is an academic fraud? Yes, we can. And if you need uh, more support for that, I can certainly provide it. The long story short is that he submitted a Nowakian deluge paper to PLOS Biology, or PLOS Biology, depending on how you say it, and he um, got that rejected. But in the interim between submission and rejection, he was circulating said paper with the PLOS or PLOS logo photoshopped to the top, which is great. That's academic fraud. Um, you don't, you don't have that. I wasn't given to him by, by the journal. He had to photoshop it on there. Um, but that's fine. It's fine. It's academic fraud. Don't even worry about it. So let's, let's begin because this chapter can only be described as one of the most, and I know this is mean, but I just can't help myself. Ramat has also not been pleasant to me in the past, so I, I feel a little less rude doing this, but it is some of the most inane, asinine, time-wasting, incorrect, dubious, ignorant, under-researched pieces of text that I've ever seen in my life. So it's going to be very fun to read together. I've already annotated it, of course, but we're going to read it together. So, let's go. <laughs> Everything the evolutionary community once thought were examples of beneficial mutations have now fallen to the new discoveries of epigenetics. Got a nice picture here of all the, oh no, all of the, all one, two, three, four, five, six of the beneficial mutations have fallen. I don't know if Raw Matt knows that there are more than that, but we'll just pretend with him for, for argument's sake. For those of you new to the word epigenetics, think of epigenetics as the science term for chemical genetic switches that flip genes on and off. Basically, it's the scientific study of gene expression. So that is, that is barely almost correct. <laughs> um, let's say you're born and have an identical twin. Your twin moves away and does totally different things with their life, such as taking up smoking, drinking, drugs, stays up late to party every night. Am I that twin? <laughs> Just kidding. You, and your, uh, you, on the other hand, get excellent sleep, uh, you exercise, eat healthy, and do not smoke or drink. The genes in both you and your identical twin would express themselves in very different ways. Uh, your epigenetic genome would be different. Yes, there are certain epigenetic changes that can differ between you and an identical twin, depending on how different you lead your lives. Although, what isn't going to change is your core genome, like your, your actual bases that make you and your identical twin up. Those would stay identical. So much so that your twin has very high odds of getting cancer, health problems, and other issues. This is because even though you have identical DNA, the genes are expressed differently between you both based on your lifestyle. That's correct. Good job, Ron, Matt. Holy cow. This is not forward evolution because evolution requires a permanent change to be passed on to future generations. And epigenetics doesn't do this. Okay, whew, we had one correct thing and I was like kind of reeling there for a second. Thank God that the immediate subsequent sentence is so boldly incorrect as to cure my instant whiplash because this man has written an entire chapter on epigenetics and does not know, I repeat, does not know that epigenetic changes can in fact be passed on to, to your offspring. So that's awesome. Off to a great start. Bodes really well for the accuracy of, of this book. Uh, why this matters so much now 
<laughs> is that evolutionists have been saying beneficial mutations have been driving the driving force for all new adaptations taking place. But when you investigate these so-called beneficial mutations deeper, you quickly realize that every example they have falls to epigenetics. All six examples. This has falsified the beneficial mutation theory. Ah uh, yes, the beneficial mutation theory alongside other greats such as germ theory, atomic theory, and evolutionary theory. For example, we have all heard of the supposed lactose mutation, the mutation that they said allows us to drink milk. <laughs> it, he's talking directly to me now. Now I want you to think logically about this first, before I disprove it with epigenetics, before Ramat personally disproves it with epigenetics. I mean, think about it. We are all born with the ability to digest milk right? Obviously, we are mammals. Well, I'm glad that he can cop to that because later Ramat will spend another series of pages telling us why we aren't apes, which is kind of hilarious. <laughs> well, it turns out after weaning, the gene flips off because we no longer need mother's milk. Pretty simple concept, right? However, in the case of some people, the gene stays switched on epigenetically. He puts epigenetically in quotations. I'm not sure why. They used to claim this was a mutation, possibly a SNP, a single SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism, where basically a point mutation resulted in lactose persistence. They were wrong. Modern science has discovered that lactose tolerance is regulated by epigenetic mutation, sorry, mechanisms such as methylation levels of the MCM6 and LCT genes. Then he's got a... <laughs> You know how they love to do this. A nice little picture of the journal that they're trying to cite. A little, a little screen grab right there. It says differences in DNA methylation and functional expression in lactose persistent and non-persistent individuals. And then underneath he says, remember, they all still use this example as proof for evolution and have been for quite some time now. Now you know what to say. Their best and most used example has been falsified. Well, I guess that's it, boys. Pack it up. I guess raw mat <laughs> debunked evolution. Raw mat in his chapter on epigenetics, in which he boldly claims that epigenetic changes aren't passed on to offspring or can't be passed on to offspring. So we're going to go into minimized mode because now we're going to have to go through all of the examples and investigate them a bit deeper. So you got me in mini mode now, and I thought we'd begin with backing up my claim that yes, epigenetic changes can be inherited. It's called epigenetic inheritance. I know, surprising. Transgenerational epigenetic inheritance is the transmission of epigenetic markers from one organism to the next, i.e. from parent to child. that affects the trait of the offspring without altering the primary structure of DNA, i.e. or e.g. the sequence of nucleotides. In other words, epigenetically. So yes, epigenetic change can, and sometimes is, passed on from parent to offspring. Um, you've also got this nice paper that goes into it a little bit more in depth, which I have pulled up here. Uh, epigenetic effects are not only common, but also underlie the influence, underlie and influence many aspects of evolution. So wait a second, epigenetic effects are a part of evolution? Why, why that debunks this entire chapter, doesn't it? That makes things very difficult. I thought epigenetics was the destroyer of evolution. How strange and how, how unheard of for this text. This is true for both epigenetic effects that are only expressed within a single generation, as well as the for transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. In this special issue, Banta and Richard show epigenetics have a profound influence over a number of evolutionary aspects by using the quantitative genetic formula of partitioning, of partitioning um, for the partitioning, rather, of phenotypic variants, they show epigenetic mechanisms can underlie or influence all of its parameters. Moreover, it's, if such epigenetic modulations are also heritable, they can be erroneously misinterpreted as genetic variants. The widespread presence of epigenetic marks in natural populations thus pose a challenge for researchers aiming to infer quantitative genetic parameters or estimate population divergence in quantitative traits. Um, which is great. That That's really really helpful for me uh, because this whole paper, as well as what we just read more specifically, underlies the whole point of why epigenetics is important to evolution and further validates it. Really, really good stuff. 
So how about we also hop very quickly to our first <laughs> beneficial mutation, which would be the lactose tolerance. So this is a paper titled Genetics of Lactose Intolerance, an updated review and online interactive world maps of phenotype and genotype frequencies. Now, before we move any further, I really want to underscore why we're going through all of these points. Because if it's not obvious, the entire chapter that Ramat has written here was BTFO'd the second he said this sentence. This is not forward evolution because evolution requires a permanent change to be passed on to future generations, and epigenetics does not do this. Epigenetics does do this, therefore, it's forward evolution. Contra to this sentence, which is the thesis statement of this entire chapter. If epigenetic changes can be passed on, then epigenetics doesn't do anything to evolution in, in the context of how raw math's presenting it. Um, and we've already discussed just now how epigenetics can be passed on, it is heritable, and how it's still evolution. In fact, that, that paper we just looked at, this one, discusses how it's evolution whether or not it's passed on, which is quite interesting. I hadn't really ever considered that. Um, but I think it's fun to look into these papers or these, these phenomena just a little bit more because this is going to come as a shock and surprise, and I know that this might be hard to take, but Ramad is wrong on a lot of them. In fact, he might be wrong on all of them. I can't quite remember. Um, so, our first example. Now, what he presents in this book is um, a paper titled Differences in DNA Methylation and Functional Expression in Lactose Persistent and Non-Persistent Individuals. So basically they're talking about the differences, the epigenetic differences between those who have lactase persistently from, from childhood to adulthood and thus can process milk as adults, and those who are non-persistent individuals with, with lactase, which means they lose the ability to process milk um, when they're youngsters, after they're weaned. And um, he's talking about how they used to claim this is a mutation, probably a single nucleotide polymorphism, but now we know that it's regulated by epigenetic mechanisms. Um, and he uses the word knows, modern sense has discovered. So, is that the case? So when we look to the conclusion of this paper, we see this. Lactose phenotypes LP and LNP in humans present a complex genetic basis that has been widely investigated during the last decades. Although great advances have been achieved, the exact molecular mechanisms underlying the appearance, the appearance rather, of LNP after weaning phase remains not fully understood. Probably the combined action of transcription factors and epigenetics, alterations on the LCT gene, is the most plausible explanation. So what they're arguing is a combination of transcription factors and epigenetic ones, heritable epigenetic ones, because if it was not heritable in its, in its nature, this would have to happen independently in every single human, which I don't think Ramat would want to argue for, given those statistics would be absolutely wild. So epigenetic, maybe partially. Let's move on to the next one. The next one Ramat, pick this back up off the floor, the next one Ramat presents. Let us take a look at the HIV-1 immunity protein. Most of the human protein production is based on the alternative splicing. I don't think he knows what he means there. So the variation of this receptor is not a mutant, although many scientific articles still say so. They are old and outdated now. Read more about this epigenetic regulation from Journey of Molecular Signaling. And then he, he's got a nice, uh, another nice little one of these bad boys. We'll picture, we'll picture there. Only 10% have resistance to HIV because of this epigenetic factor. Um, let's find out about that, shall we? <laughs> All right, I've got this paper pulled up because it's, it's quite recent. It's from 2019. So Romat should certainly know about this given this is a mid 2020-ish text, we'll say. And um, this paper is titled The Mutation of Transportin-3 Gene That Causes Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy. 1F Induces Protection Against HIV-1 Infection. So what does that mean? <laughs> this 
causative mutation responsible for limb girdle muscular dystrophy is one heterozygous single nucleotide deletion in the stop codon of the nuclear import factor transportin 3 gene, so TNP. This mutation causes a carboxyl terminal extension of 15 amino acids, producing a protein of unknown function that is co-expressed with wild-type TNPO3. TNPO3 has been involved in the nuclear transport of serine-arginine-rich proteins such as the splicing factors and also in HIV-1 infection through interaction with the viral integrase and capsid. We analyzed the effect of TNPO3 mutagen on HIV-1 infection using the PBMCs from patients with LGMD1F infected ex vivo. HIV-1 infection was drastically impaired in these cells and viral integration was reduced, reduced 16 fold. No significant effects on viral reverse transcription and episomal 2 LTR circles were observed suggesting that the integration of HIV-1 gene was restricted. This is the second genetic defect described after CCR Delta 32 that shows strong resistance against HIV-1 infection. So I dropped the book, but point being, this isn't even the mutation that Raw Matt is talking about in, in this text. Nevertheless, it too causes a resistance to HIV. It, it impairs the virus's ability to actually infect. That's the mutation. This is a mutation, not an epigenetic change. So he's wrong on this one. He's not partially right. You don't get partial credit like you did for the lactose intolerance. Now, the one that he's talking about is, let's see, He's got um, D3 NF mRNA, uh, which helps prevent the infection by HIV-1. I don't know, maybe there is a genetic aspect that can, sorry, an epigenetic uh, change that can help HIV resistance, uh, but he's trying to tell us that the genetic change, not the epigenetic change, has been reverted to an epigenetic change. This is genetic and it's 2019, I couldn't find anything more recent uh, on this particular um, topic. So as far as I know, this one and the other one that isn't this epigenetic change where Matt is mentioning are both still baseline genetic changes. So mutations, beneficial mutations, but I'm not a geneticist. Next, what about increased bone density mutation? Again, this is not a beneficial mutation. It is an epigenetic regulation that is regulated by our bodies depending what we do on what we do. Um, it's an epigenetic regulation that is regulated, folks. It has nothing to do with the mutation like they say. Make sure to read, and then he gives us more homework because Raw Matt seemingly cannot be bothered in this book that he's writing to actually summarize the articles that he's telling us to go read, which is just excellent. I can't help but wonder if he, like, read the article and didn't have enough background information to synthesize it into a digestible paragraph for a layman, because Raw Matt is a layman. Here are some excerpts from their newest study, investigating this supposed mutation. Current research data suggest epigenetic modification, microRNAs and mRNAs, that are responsible for acute to acute uh, aerobic and resistance exercise in the brain, blood, skeletal, and cardiac muscle. Then he's got another thing that says epigenetics and bone remodeling. I don't know if you can see them right there. Uh -huh. Which says multiple subsequent studies have substantiated this association, implicating other WNT pathway genes in human genetic diseases of bone mineral density. It follows then that epigenetic changes in the WNT pathway genes are associated, excuse me, with alterations of bone material, sorry, mineral density and osteoblast function. So it looks like <laughs> what what this is discussing in, in this upper epigenetics and bone remodeling paper reference that's a picture is a specific a specific article. So I pulled it up. <laughs> I hope no one minds. So this is from 2017. It says, purpose of review, bone modeling is a diverse field of study with many direct clinical applications. Past studies have implicated epigenetic alterations as key factors of both normal bone tissue development, function, and diseases of pathologic bone remodeling. The purpose of this article is to review the most recent advances, ad, sorry, advances that link epige, epigenetic changes to bone remodeling field, to the bone remodeling field. Epigenetics describes three major phenomena, DNA modification via methylation, histone side chain modifications, and short non-coding RNA sequences, which work to concert 
and regulate gene transcription in a heritable fashion. In a heritable fashion. So again, remember when Ramat says that epigenetics disproves evolution because it can't be passed on to future generations? He says, this is not forward evolution because evolution requires a permanent change to be passed on to further generations, and epigenetics does not do this. Um, this specific example violates that yet again. The, the, the next example violates this and, uh, once more. Recent findings include the role of DNA methylation, changes of W and T, rank and rank L, and other signaling pathways, epigenetic regulation of the osteoblast and osteoclast differentiation, and others. Although much work has been done, much is still unknown. Future epigenome-wide studies should focus on extending tissue coverage, integrating multiple epigenetic anal analyses sorry, with transcriptome data, and working to uncover epigenetic changes linked with early events in aberrant bone remodeling. So cool, this is really neat for, for bone remodeling. This is really awesome. What about other kinds of bone density changes? So this is titled High Bone Density Due to a Mutation in the LDL Receptor-Related Protein 5. Not an epigenetic mutation. In fact, uh-oh, no epigenetics in this entire article. But let's see what they have to say anyways. Osteoporosis is a major public health concern of largely unknown cause. Loss of function mutations in the gene for low-density lipoprotein receptor-related protein 5, uh, which is LRP5, which acts on the WNT signaling pathway, have been shown to cause osteoporosis and pseudoglioma. No mistake. Um, genetic analyses revealed linkage of the syndrome to chromosome 11Q1213. Affected members of the kindred had a mutation in this gene had a mutation in this gene. This mutation segregated with the trait in family uh, and was absent in control subjects. Um, it's, it's a mutation. It is an, it's just like another mutation, not an epigenetic change, a mutation. Um, this mutation causes high bone density with thickened mandible and torus palatinus, palatinus with impairing sorry, by impairing the action of normal antagonists of the WNT pathway, thus increasing WNT signaling. These findings demonstrate the role of altered LRP5 function in high bone mass and point due to DKK as a potential target for the prevention or treatment of osteoporosis. This was from let's see, 2002. This is an old paper. There's no reason Rama should know about this. Um, I don't know. Well, I guess we'll continue onward. Okay, next. What about the high altitude evolution of Tibetan Sherpa? This is another evolutionary common claim of a single point mutation. He has point mutation in quotation marks. Leads to a better adaption in the high altitudes within Tibet people. But again, they jumped the gun because of their evolutionary mindset and now have to pull it from the shelves. Modern science has revealed that epigenetic mechanisms are behind this clever adaptation. Read the peer-reviewed Reach On. Read the peer-reviewed Reach On. I don't know what he's trying to say there. It, it says, it says, read the peer review, read the peer review, reach on. Let's see, can you see that? Yeah, right there. This sentence right there. I don't know what he's trying to say. And then he has uh, epigenetic structures of high altitude adaptation in Tibetan population. It's a 2017 paper. Basically, in their findings, they observed six significantly differentially methylated regions in the highland living Tibetans compared to other lowlanders. Among them, five regions were hypomethylated and one was hypermethylated. Out of these regions, two are present in the CYP2E1 and CRELD1 genes, which were reported to be involved in high altitude adaptation genetically. So <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's touch on this one, shall we? Got this bad boy right here. Oops, not that one. This one. Epigenetic signatures of high altitude adaptation in Tibetan populations. It's that one Ramat mentioned. Let's read the first sentence of the abstract. Genetic adaptations in high altitude populations which provide them survival benefit advantages in high altitude have been well documented. Genetic changes, genetic adaptations mutations that are beneficial to high altitude populations have been documented. Sorry, well documented. Then they go on to say, however, till date, very limited studies on the epigenetic adaptation in high altitude human populations um, 
have been done. Therefore, we aim to study the high altitude adaptation to bat population with respect to epigenetic adaptation. Again, this isn't an overturning of previous mutations in order to, to swap them into the epigenetic realm. This is a further study on specifically epigenetic adaptation for something that regular old genetic adaptation was already doing. So another strike for raw mat, it seems. It is cool, though. Okay, next up. Adaptations due to deep diving in Bajau. This is one of the newest fables they are claiming is another example of new random beneficial mutation. This adaptation of the spleen to enlarge so that it can hold more oxygen, they claimed, again, that a one-point mutation, that a one-point mutation, I think he means that a single-point mutation occurred, of the PDE10A gene that causes the larger spleen to evolve, which results in the more efficient red, red, cell, red blood cell production, thus longer time underwater. There is at least one evolutionary pseudoscientific research study made over this. Boy, can you can you sense the irony in, in a grammatically incorrect sentence using the word pseudoscientific? I can. That study didn't take into account any epigenetic mechanisms, such as histone epigenetic markers, DNA methylation profiles, or non-coding RNA molecules. He, he just, just reused that from the previous page. The study noticed one thing, a single point mutation change, and based on this, it claims that the adaptation to diving is caused by genetic beneficial mutation that randomly arose. But as that synopsis summarizes, it's most likely an epigenetic effect. I don't know what synopsis he's referring to unless he's meaning this, like, I, I kid you not, it's like a comment on some kind of message board. and. And genetics is spelled wrong in it. Let me, let, me, let me show you just so you can appreciate what we're looking at here. Okay. All right. So it says, No doubt that the genesis code, A-G-C-T, will not change in response to any intra or extra, ex, sorry, intra or extracellular stimuli e.g. exercise. However, exercise might trigger epigenetic changes, DNA methylation, histone modification, uh, and nCRNAs, which will modulate the accessibility to the genetic code. And then he continues to say, if such epigenetics changes are inheritable, then there is possibility of exercise, exercise is spelled wrong, by the way, mediated epigenetic changes that might result in the selection of fitter individuals. In the literature, there are examples of permanent changes in the epigenetic code that can be inherited. This person probably speaks English as a second language, so honestly, I shouldn't even be poking fun at the, at the misspellings. I, I'm mostly just thinking that the misspellings are there because this is on a scientific forum and not from, like, the literature, which if Ramad is trying to, like, debunk the, the genetic basis rather than epigenetic basis for this uh, increased spleen and oxygen, um, larger spleen rather, and increased oxygen efficiency, I think you should pull from the literature and not a message board. Um, but interestingly enough, um, Bunyamin Akul also notes that epigenetic changes are inheritable. There is the possibility of exercise-mediated epigenetic changes that result in the selection of fitter individuals. He's saying that the epigenetics can be passed on. Ramat wrote this. He, he should have read this at some point of putting it in here. Um, but I guess not. He goes, Serious scientists already know exercise will not actually change the sequence of the DNA. No, but epigenetics are heritable. <laughs> it's methylation levels that can be altered, and this can result in DNA errors or markers. But the DNA sequence error mutation is not the reason for the larger spleen or increased levels of T4 hormone. So he doesn't, like, I, I want to note something to you here. He cites this paper that says that it's a genetic adaptation, right? He calls it pseudoscientific, and then on the next page, he says that the synopsis below tells you that it's actually just an epigenetic change because exercise can cause epigenetic changes. Raw Matt is making that conclusion. It's not in the literature, at least nothing that he's brought up so far. So, And coincidentally enough, in this paper right behind us, you can see it says, in this study, we identify multiple candidate genes for adaptation 
to the breath hole diving in the Zhao. We investigated one of the one of the candidate genes, the one where I mentioned here, PDE10A, in detail, and the rest remain promising targets for stu for future studies. So let's see if we can find Gen Edix. Looks like we just have an epigenetics browser that's being used. Epigenomics browser being used. What about we've got permutation? Any mentions of regular mutations? It is important to note that because the lead variants may not be the causal variants, this might affect our estimates and skew our conclusions towards selection from standing variation rather than de novo mutation. So the work that they're they've identified some potential genes as like genes where the change has occurred, but they think that the way that they're doing their research is potentially skewed towards not identifying those genes and rather toward rather not a genetic change and more towards uh, not a mutation rather but more towards standing variation between population within a population that's being selected upon. Either way, it's not looking at genetic to me. It's looking to me like raw Matt pulled this from somewhere. Ramus Nielsen, who's this by? Is it Ramus Nielsen? Nope, not even by, Ra oh wait, Rasmus Nielsen. Yes, Rasmus Nielsen. So this is the paper. So this is the paper that Raw Matt was referring to. And it, I guess it did indeed find that it's a genetic thing, if that's what he presented. Um. <laughs> so because the spleen plays a central role in prolonging free diving time as it forms part of what is known as the human dive response, so because the spleen plays a central role in prolonging free diving time, as it forms part of what is known as the human dive, I don't think that's like a coherent sentence. So because the spleen plays a central role in prolonging free diving time, I think he, he didn't need the as, I think it was just supposed to go, it forms part of what is known as the human dive response. Okay. That's why you get an editor. Then, when the human body is submerged under cold water for even brief amounts of time, their response is triggered as a method of assisting the body to survive in an oxygen-deprived environment. Heart rate slows down, blood vessels in extremity shrink to preserve blood for vital organs, and the spleen contracts. Interestingly enough, babies have the mammalian dive reflex. If you throw a baby in a pool, it automatically holds its breath. I don't know that from experience, or do I? This contraction of the spleen creates an oxygen boost by ejecting oxygenated red blood cells into circulation has been found, found to provide up to a 90% increase in oxygen, oxygen thereby prolonging dive time. This is, the evidence for this is now that genes are regulated by epigenetic mutation mechanisms and not random mutation in just some people, but anyone who does these activities for prolonged periods of time. This is vindicated by the fact that the results were sequenced at University of Copenhagen clearly showed the Bajau divers had a median spleen size 50% larger than their neighboring people in Salouan. When testing Bajau peoples, enlarged spleens were also visible in non-diving Bajau individuals, as well as those who regularly free dive. The reason for this is because Bajau people have PDE10A, an enzyme that the Salawan people do not have that codes for the gene, allowing the gene to express itself. So because of this, the Bajau people are epigenetically inheriting activated gene expression from this enzyme for enlarged sleep. He wrote sleep and will pass it on to future generations regardless of if they swim or not. Since the PDE10 aging controls the levels of the thyroid hormone T4, and they found a correlation between obesity and thyroid, which, and between obesity, which the thyroid helps regulate, this study concluded, we believe the Bajau, in the Bajau, they have an adaptation that increases thyroid hormone levels and therefore increases their spleen size. It's been shown in mice that thyroid hormones and spleen size are connected. If you genetically alter mice to have an absence of thyroid hormone T4, their spleen is drastically reduced. This effect is reversible with an injection of T4. And now we have yet another example of where evolutionists jumped the gun, calling yet another basic adaptation a beneficial mutation when it was not a mutation at all, just a chemical switch that activates a gene that already has the pre-existing function built in. Wait a second. I don't think that's what's going on here. I... <laughs> Uh, so I actually had to go back and check because reading that last section had me kind of stroking out. I felt like I was 
actively undergoing some kind of horrific medical aberration while reading. Um, but I did find, I think, what I'm looking for. Um, and for th we're going to have to reread that section so we can appreciate exactly what Raw Matt is saying because it's it's something. <laughs> so, remember, he's trying to argue that the constant diving that the Bajau people are doing is causing an epigenetic change that is not rooted in a beneficial mutation. That's his point. He says, the contraction of the spleen creates an oxygen boost by ejecting oxygenated red blood cells into circulation and has been found to provide up to a 9% increase in oxygen, thereby prolonging dive time. This, this evidence, or rather the evidence for this, is now that genes are regulated by epigenetic mechanisms and not random mutation in just some people, but anyone who does these activities for long periods of time. So that's wrong. Genes can be regulated by epigenetics. They, they are regulated by epigenetics, but they're also decided by random mutation. Mutations change genes in in um, crossing over events and any kind of sexual interaction that results in offspring is going to have a set number of mutations. That's that's like the whole benefit of sexual reproduction uh, over asexual reproduction because those ben those mutations might be beneficial um, and then provide a, a fitness benefit for the organism receiving it. So he continues, so that's already wrong. So he continues, this is now vindicated by the fact that the results were sequenced at the University of Copenhagen and clearly showed the Bajai divers have a median spleen size 50% larger than, than their neighboring people, the Saluan. Okay, that, that sentence is not grammatically correct, but what he's trying to say is that there was a test done that showed the Bajai people had 50% larger spleens. That's what helps them be better free drive divers. Cool, check. Then he's got this in bold. When testing the Bajau peoples, enlarged spleens were also visible in non-diving Bajau individuals as well as those who regularly free dive. That shouldn't be the case if it's epigenetics, because it should only be activating in the ones that are, are constantly doing this diving according to raw mat, according to what he just said. That is what the connection is supposed to be. It's the opposite of what he said it was. And the reason is because it's a mutation in the genes of the Balawan people that then, or in the past, in, in, in the genes of a Balawan person. And it proliferated throughout the entire population because it gave a huge fitness benefit to the ones who had it. They were better free divers and they probably got uh, more, more opportunities to mate, whether they're male or female. Um, that's how these things happen. This sentence that he put in his own section roasts his own thesis statement at least of the, the, the free diving. Then he goes, the reason for this is because the Bajal people have PDE10A, an enzyme that the Salawan people do not have that codes for the PDE10A gene. That's not how genetics works. The gene codes for the enzyme. The enzyme doesn't code for the gene. Allowing the gene to express itself. No. So because of this, the Bajau people are epigenetically inheriting, and he said earlier in this chapter that epigenetics were inherited, activated gene expression from this enzyme for a, an enlarged sleep. That's what he wrote here, an enlarged sleep, and will pass it on to future generations regardless of whether they swim or not. Since the, PDA 10, since the PDE10A gene controls the levels of thyroid hormone T4, and they have found a correlation between obesity, which the thyroid helps regulate. None of that really matters. The point is that Ramat put an example that debunks him in the book because he doesn't understand what he wrote out. That's unbelievable. I'm disappointed, but not surprised. Okay, golly, all right. When will the evolutionists community as a whole learn? My guess, never. They are too dogmatic without any ability to see outside their narrow-minded worldview, as I once was. Ah, our, <laughs> our enlightened friend, Ramath. Once I dropped the blinders, I could finally see the bigger picture and read between the lines. Anytime you hear about a new beneficial mutation, please make sure to investigate it and give it time. You will watch it fall from the list like all the rest. 
that's the end of the of this appendix and also with two cartoons that I assume he didn't draw um, someone should copyright strike that um, anyways that was bonkers I can't believe that he just made that mistake but I mean well I can believe it but I was hoping it wouldn't happen now just to kind of top things off there are a couple of other kind of nice mutations that exist for humans that are, are indeed beneficial. Uh, there, there's the classic sickle cell anemia, which is indeed a mutation, and under the proper environment, it can be hugely beneficial. Oh, here's just so you know. Just checking to make sure that this was indeed uh, a gene. Um, and this handy dandy little list here talks about a couple of other nice mutations. Um, Apple lipoprotein AI AL Milano. Uh, basically, what it does is it is it reduces your risk for your you reduces your risk for certain heart abnormalities by um, dissolving certain arterial plaques and the like. Uh, what is it? Eighty eight percent lower risk of heart disease. Boy, I sure would say that that's beneficial. And boy, it is a mutation, isn't it? Interesting. Wonder why Roma didn't include that one on the list. Probably couldn't figure out a way to mess it up. Uh, sickle cell anemia, we already talked about that. And then there was one more on here, this little list that I liked. Yeah. Tetrachromatic vision. If you're a woman and you get this mutation, then you can see far more colors than anyone else. That's kind of neat, kind of cool. Um, anyways, I, <laughs> I hope that that was fun and enlightening for you. It was for me, but not necessarily for the reasons that I was thinking. I am of course disappointed again by the content of this book. It has not been grammatically checked, it's not formatted well, and the information is of course just aggressively incorrect at every turn. But you'll be pleased to know that the next section is my favorite section. It's titled Appendix 2, Missing Links Revisited by Standing for Truth and Raw Math the author himself back on the scene um and i think it's i don't know if it's possible to be more incorrect than raw Matt's single chapter but this one's pretty bad some of the other chapters that i'm excited to go through i know they're appendices i don't care they should have just called them chapters uh there's one titled refuting dating methods will millions of years rescue human evolution this one's by standing for truth so naturally it's a cut above grammatically uh, at least when we're just looking at, at raw Matt's work, not on the whole. Uh, and then we have another one that's quite good, Cladistics by Raw Matt. That has a lot of power as a statement, doesn't it? You just shivered. I could feel you from where I'm at through space and time. It's really, really, really bad. And um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll have three more episodes of this. Isn't that exciting? Um, Anyways, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes, I do hope you take care of yourselves. Um, be well. Continue, get vaccinated. We do love that. I've, I've been vaccinated fully. Uh, my haters will hope that it is my downfall, but I'm stronger than ever. And um, I think that's going to be it for me. Ta.